All right, so our second speaker uh, this morning is uh, uh, by uh, Jorgen Reynimo from uh, University of Oslo here. So he's going to talk about uh, the birational trolley problem for uh, Calabria three folds. So uh, please, Jorgen. Great, thanks for the uh, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction and thanks for the the opportunity to speak here. Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, so, so uh, as you said, the title here is the birational trolley problem for Calabria threefolds, and as you can see on the board, this is joint work with John Autumn, uh, also in Oslo. Um, so it's uh, this is work uh, that we did in uh, like four years ago in in twenty seventeen, and we went around. I, I mean, there's a there's a paper, and we went around giving talks about it. Um, so my sort of my expectation based on the on the title and the theme of this conference is that uh, the audience will not have been exposed to this previously. Uh, so I'll try to sort of give a and that they're not sort of specialists in in this in this particular area. So I'll try and give a, a, a basic overview of what the what the statement is and what uh, what we do. I should say if you if you have seen this result before or if you. you if you know this, then what I'm saying today will be exactly the same as what I would have said in, in 2017. So this is just, uh, uh, there have been some minor developments since, but I'll, this is just, I'll just focus on uh, on the result that we proved uh, back then. Um, I will also, there is, uh, so this is not like uh, directly, uh, obviously linked to uh, say the, the standard conjectures, but there is a, there is some, some form of connection, which I'll try to uh, to highlight uh, at some point, a small sideline. Anyway, so what is um, so this is um, right. So 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 what are we? Uh, what is uh, the problem? This birational trolley problem. Well, we'll get to it in steps. But first of all, to set the stage, we just we're working uh, over the field C. We'll be dealing with uh, asking questions about hot structures and cohomology. So this is an essential assumption for us um, and x to begin with uh, x let x just be a general smooth and projective variety uh, uh, of dimension n so um, given such a smooth and projective variety you can look at uh, the a particular cohomology group uh, so this this middle uh, cohomology group with integer coefficients uh, which we'll write just h and x um, so this thing then has um, has well it's in a, it's a it's an abelian group but it also has a Hodge decomposition. Uh, so it has some extra structure, one of which is the the Hodge decomposition. <clears throat> so the complexification of this thing splits into has this extra uh, has this extra grading. So it splits into these spaces like so. And it also has the structure of a bilinear pairing uh, given by taking the uh, cup product of classes uh, in this uh, middle cohomology group. So we have uh, this uh, pairing to, to set, which is given by uh, integrating top product. So this is uh, symmetric or skew symmetric, depending on whether n is even or not. Right? But it's always non degenerate as being that being Poincare duality. Anyway, the uh, the so the Torelli question is roughly speaking, how uh, how much can you say about x uh, given given access to this data of the middle cohomology group with this this structure? So. Um, and I'm not sure this is like official terminology, but this, uh, this, would, this would I like to think of as the Torelli question uh, or Torelli problem is. Um, so suppose you have, um, suppose you have that, uh, you have two uh, varieties, x1 and x2, and they are, they have isomorphic middle cohomology groups in just such a way that they respect uh, these two structures. Uh, then must we have? Then must x one be isomorphic to x two. 
So, um, <clears throat> so there are a few. Uh, so can we can we complete a determinant x by by looking at its middle option? So there are a few things to say about this. Like uh, first of all, obviously the answer is formulated formulated in this general sense is. Uh, is, is obviously no, there are, are, are lots of classes of varieties for which the middle Hodge structure doesn't really tell you anything about the uh, isomorphism type. So one uh, simple example is to take the, the plane, the projective plane, P2, blown up in, in many points, then the middle Hodge structure contains no data, but moving the points around will, will change the, the isomorphism type of the variety. Uh, so this is not really a, a sensible question to ask in this uh, complete generality. And it turns out that the, uh, the sensible restriction, which leads in some cases to, to positive results, is we require, so this will always be a requirement for us, we require that, uh, or maybe uh, the, the extra thing to say is assuming, assuming that we fixed to begin with the topology of X, or to put it differently, assuming that uh, X1 and X2 are deformation equivalent. So with this, uh, with this extra, uh, with, the, with this extra assumption, the problem becomes, you can think of the problem as saying you fix uh, a variety which has a certain topology, then you, uh, you vary the complex structure, which will change the Hodge decomposition of the, the middle cohomology. And the question is, is this sort of the change of the Hodge structure uh, a good enough invariant to pick up all the change in the, in the complex structure uh, of the isomorphism? So, um, so this is a sensible question in that it occasionally, for some deformation equivalence classes, uh, this has a positive result, a positive answer. So yes, if, um, if the xi are say so we can the first instance where this is a has a positive uh, answer is it's true if, uh, if these are curves which is uh Torelli's theorem although i mean he, he would have formulated it differently but um so it's also true uh if uh these are k3 surfaces so this is due to various people in various forms in the in the 70s and 80s. Um, so this is uh, you can ask this for uh, for complex analytic K3 services, ultra ones. Uh, you can take polarized K3 services. There are lots of very different versions, but but in the upshot is essentially the answer is the answer is yes in many different uh, for many different refinements of the question. Then uh, so one other famous class where this works is cubic fourfolds. So this is the result by Massa. Uh, one can like a variation of this, of course, is, is abelian varieties, where it's uh, where it's where instead you look at the instead of looking at the middle one, you look at the first one, first cohomology group, um, and then more or less by definition, uh, the, this totally question has a has a positive answer. So. Um, so uh, one sort of uh, general phenomenon, which has some, some theorems to back it up, is that um, things which are more or less Calabi-Yau type, uh, so for instance, the, the K3 surfaces and abelian varieties, um, are things where you stand a chance of, of having, um, having a Torelli theorem. So uh, K3 surfaces and abelian surfaces being the uh, calabi varieties in dimension two, you can ask, well, you can ask about, uh, you can ask the question about, can you have a Torelli theorem for general Calabi-Yau varieties? But the first um, first instance in which this is, uh, well, at least a while ago was was unknown was the was the case of Calabi-Yau threefolds. So that is what we're uh, focusing on. Uh, so to be precise, what do I mean by a Calabi-Yau threefold? One can mean slightly different things, but but uh, it's an X with well. Obviously, the dimension is three, and the canonical bundle is trivial. Um, and we also require that the first uh, cohomology group of the structure sheet vanishes. So then the Torelli problem uh, for such Calabi-Yau threefolds uh, 
there's the following question. Um, if you have two of them, if x1 and x2 are deformation equivalent, uh, Calabia three folds, uh, and they have uh, equivalent isomorphic middle hot structures. So when I write cohomology groups with uh, this isomorphism sign, I always mean I always mean that they preserve these these structures here one and two. So assuming this, uh, assuming they are have isomorphic middle uh, cohomology groups, well, this should be then, sorry, this should be pH three. Then, the, then must they be isomorphic, right? That's the, that's the question. Can you, can you determine which one you have based on just the, the Hodge, Hodge data in the middle, middle cohomology group? Um, so I should say this is a this is a, uh, uh, one reason this is a subtle question is we have very little control over deformation equivalence types of Calabi threes. So we know there is a, a very large number of distinct deformation equivalence classes of Calabi threes, uh, and it's not known whether this very large number is actually infinite uh, or not, but it's certainly certainly a big number anyway. Um, and so you might ask sort of refined theoretical problems, saying for this given deformation equivalence class does this statement hold? Uh, so there are lots of sort of sub problems here, but, but for this, this talk, we'll just sort of focus on the general, like, can you have a, can you have a general result saying for all, um, all different deformation equivalence classes of Calabia three folds? And it's been known for some time, uh, uh, 15 years to be precise, that the answer is no. So this is a, Result by Sendroy from 04, where he uh, so he constructs uh, x1 and x2, which are Calabi R3s, uh, which are so they're related uh, to one another in the following three ways they are deformation equivalent. They are birational to one another, and yet they are uh, non isomorphic. And uh, I claim that this actually then uh, shows that um, the Torelli problem for Claudia Threes has a negative um, has a negative answer. And why is this? Well, it's a general. Uh, it's it's known that uh, x1 and x2 being birational. Um, so it's not this isn't this isn't an obvious statement by any means, but it's known that x1 and x2 being birational implies that actually they have the same middle hot structure. And so so uh, uh, to really. For CY3s uh, fails. So, um, so these two, these uh, x1 and x2 of the theorem being birational have the same middle hot structure, but as we, as he shows that they are non isomorphic, um, they, uh, they, they give a counterexample to this, uh, this Torelli problem for, for CY3s. So, I should say, <clears throat> uh, like the, the, the examples he writes down aren't that, that difficult, but it's it is uh, it is a subtle thing to get all of these three things happening at the same time. So it's easy to find examples of um, Calabi R threes which are birational uh, and non-isomorphic. The the tricky thing is to check that you then haven't haven't changed the deformation equivalence type, um, which um, well, which which sender then. Uh, does. So, um, so this was this was sort of uh, the most optimistic version of a Torelli problem that you could hope for. Um, there, uh, the thing to do now is uh, well. So there are various ways in which you can you can weaken this uh, this Torelli problem and maybe ask could something could something weaker be through be, be still true. 
and the uh, so there are different ways and the one the one way I'm going to uh, focus on today is the birational Torelli problem. Uh, let's see if I can let's see if I can do this. All right, so uh, birational Torelli problem. It's the same thing, uh, but you're taking our cue from uh, from Sandro's counter example, where the problem was you could find things which were um, in the same deformation equivalence class, which were birational but non isomorphic. You can ask, is this the only thing that can go wrong? So you can ask, must then x1 be birational? to x2. Right, so, so the question is, uh, can this middle hot structure at least determine what x is up to birational equivalence? Which would be a, a fairly good thing to, would be pretty satisfactory, would be a pretty good thing if we, if we, we had that. And uh, I should, uh, so I, I'll, I'll quickly, uh, uh, you know, Break the break the excitement and tension by spoiling by by saying the answer is actually the answer is uh, no. So this is a pretty um, this is a pretty negative talk. It's, it's actually a better title for this talk would be uh, you know, failure of of birational Torelli. So this is really strictly speaking about about finding finding counterexamples and finding interesting counterexamples. Uh, so the answer is no, and this is uh, this is the the main theorem for today for for this talk is. This is the result uh, shown by by, uh, by Autumn and myself, and independently, and more or less simultaneously by Boris of Calderaru. And uh, Perry. So, uh, and in fact, uh, the counterexample uh, that we find, uh, both of these groups working independently came upon the same counterexample. So I want to explain to you what the counterexample is, just to show you that this is a very simple thing. Um, and then the rest of the talk will be about explaining where this comes from and, and how we actually prove this theorem. So uh, to describe the counterexample, um, we first let, so we, we, we take, uh, so we take the, the Grassmannian, to cook up this counterexample, take the Grassmannian, Two five, which by the, the Flickr embedding lives inside P nine, and uh, we let uh, G in the general linear group on ten elements, and this general linear group acts on the Grassmannian. Sorry, this general linear group acts on the ambient projective space. And uh, what you then can do is you can take, if you now let Z G be the intersection of one of the original Grassmannian with the G translate uh, of this Grassmannian, then uh, Z G and uh, Z G transpose give a counterexample. Give a counterexample to birational Torelli. To birational uh, CY3 Torelli uh, when G is generic. Right, so I'm saying here, I'm saying these these two guys are uh, collab L3s, which have the same, which have the same middle hot structure, uh, and they're they're obviously uh, they're obviously deformation equivalent since they depend on this parameter G. So you can just sort of by varying G, you turn G into into this set G into this set G transpose, <clears throat> um, and the, the the statement is they have the same middle hot structure, 
also uh, also uh, they're not birational. So that's um, that uh, that. So to the extent that one cares about the birational uh, trailer problem in the in the form I I stated it, uh, that just uh, ends that question. The, the the answer to that is is no. And then there's still variations, other other ways of weakening trailer, which which are open and interesting. And when there's where there's actually like serious hope of having positive results, but but that's a that's a different thing. So, um, are there any questions about this, about like the, the, the story up to this point? Because we'll, we'll be leaving, <laughs> we're taking a sharp left turn at this point. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, in this bi-rational uh, theory problem, or original theory problem, or why do we need to assume the two varieties are deformation equivalent? Uh, so, for example, in cases of surface system, I yeah. Think we need a right? So, so in all K3 surfaces are deformation equivalent. Okay. So the assumption is is uh, is is taken to give us something which has a chance of being true, right? So if it's um, so to to put it differently, if if we were to uh, yeah, I mean, if we don't if if we don't require deformation equivalence, then then it's even easier to find counterexamples, I suppose. And it would be kind of um, at least in my mind, like the spirit of the question of Torelli is is whether variations in complex structure are actually recorded in variations in the Hodge structure. So when you have two things which are in different deformation equivalence classes, it's somehow it's, that's not quite right, but you can somehow think of it as accidental that it would have the same same middle hot structure. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. So. Okay. That, that one, yeah. So um, yeah, certainly, like any anything which is like a positive answer to a Torelli problem takes the assumption of deformation equivalence is, is baked into it. Mm. Okay, so uh, so where does this come from? Um, so this is uh, this this thing about the trolley problem was is, is in some sense more of a, like a, a sales pitch or a hook uh, because um, the thing that uh, the place where this comes from and the thing that I uh, generally work work more on uh, is questions related to uh, derived categories. So this is a spin-off off of uh, some technological development uh, in understanding um, more special kinds of, uh, you might call them examples in, uh, in dealing with uh, derived categories of varieties. Um, so, uh, so to just be precise about what we mean, we'll let uh, D of X now uh, be notation for was more usually more properly written uh, db coax. So this is the bounded derived category. Bounded derived category of coherent sheaves uh, on x. OK, so d of x uh, is a triangulate category. Meaning, roughly speaking, a category with some 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 notion of exact sequence. The the objects in this category are uh, are finite complexes of coherent sheaves, and and like the main the main point about it is it knows everything there is to know about the logical algebra of coherent sheaves on X. Um, so, and I'll also use this shorthand for triangulated category. Uh, I'll draw this triangle. Um, so uh, right, so this this derived category is, is mostly, uh, I mean, initially designed to be uh, used to understand and work with uh, homological homological algebra and understanding current sheaves on X. So uh, in a later historical development, it turned out to sort of be a very useful kind of 
you can think of it as kind of an invariant. So as a category with the structure of triangular category, it becomes an interesting invariant of, uh, of a variety X. So there's a sort of general problem, which one can loosely describe as, um, as that of computing uh, the computing this category as a triangular category. So this is one has to sort of, I mean, this is kind of loose terminology because uh, is it, the category has, I mean, has uh, an infinite amount of data in it. And it's not like, it, there's little hope of giving it in terms of generators and relations or something like that. But uh, what you can hope to do, for instance, is uh, you can find a different variety Y such that, um, such that D of X is equivalent to D of Y as a triangular category. So uh, this turns out to be a sensible problem. And it turns out that you can actually find examples of distinct varieties which have uh, equivalent, um, which have equivalent direct categories. So one particular, uh, one particularly uh, good class of examples uh, realizing this is, uh, comes from a result of Bridgeland saying that uh, if you have x1 and x2, uh, if they are uh, birational caveat threes, then indeed they will have equivalent direct categories. So much like the, the Hodge structure, uh, the middle Hodge structure couldn't tell um, by rational Claudia threes apart, the derived category also is in some sense insensitive to the by rational modification in the, for Claudia three pools. And, and those two facts are actually, are actually connected. So uh, we have the following uh, uh, lemma, uh, which says that under those assumptions, so if you have x1 and x2 are birational, sorry, they're not birational, they are Calabia threes, such that their drive categories are the same, are, are equivalent as triangular categories, then in fact, they also have equivalent middle hot structures. So this gives like, so this is not the, uh, the first or the simplest proof of this, uh, the claim we had before that by rational, um, by rational cloud R3s have the same middle hot structures, but this, this is one way of getting to a proof of this. Uh, prove that by rational things are derived equivalent and then prove that derived equivalent stuff, varieties are, uh, have the same middle hot structure. I should say also, I should warn you if you're, uh, I mean, the, the relation in general between the, the derived category and the cohomology groups are, is, is very subtle. And it's not known, for instance, in general, whether derived equivalent varieties must, must even have the same Betty numbers. Um, but uh, things, things work out fairly nicely in low dimension and, and for Clavia threefolds. Uh, indeed, we can, we can get this, this kind of implication here. So, um, so now we can sort of, uh, it makes sense to, to rephrase our, uh, our earlier birational Calabia, birational Torelli problem uh, to a, uh, a third version of these things, which is the, uh, the derived Torelli problem. Okay, so, uh, Instead of asking for things, uh, instead of asking for these to have the same middle cohomology group, we can ask for them to have the same derived category. And uh, well, I suppose this is the derived and birational Torelli problem. Uh, then so if you have two Calabi uh, three folds with the same chart category, then must x one be birational to x two. So I'm I'm 
I, so I, I realized with this copy and pasting, I'm getting kind of lost in this myself. So I imagine this must be even worse for you. Uh, but okay, so this is the uh, this is now the, the the main question we're going to focus on. Like if if you have two uh, uh, trees in the same deformation equivalence class, uh, can they be uh, derived equivalent without being irrational? So Bridgman's theorem gives you one way of producing derived equivalences. We're looking for can we find uh, some other uh, way in which to connect and which, which to show that two um, uh, Clavier threes are, uh, are derived equivalent uh, without being birational. And we want, so in order to produce the counterexample to birational, uh, in order to produce a counterexample to birational to Rayleigh, we want, uh, we want uh, answer to be null, right? We want we want counterexample to this. Okay, so before um, so 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 the next step is to sort of explain what kind of technology do you have. Where do we go looking for 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 examples of um, different varieties with with the same derived category? Um, so before doing that. Um, uh, let me just mention one thing. Like this, is perhaps the appropriate point to mention the, the connection this has to to the standard conjecture uh, or other other conjectures as well. So, so the standard connection connection, and this is not. I mean, this is something I. I, I barely know anything about, and to the extent I know anything about it, it's from. Uh, Work of Tabada, and basically the the general the general principle is like you can given a given a conjecture, uh, you can you can ask for a uh, non commutative or homological version of that conjecture, and formulate that you can ask can the conjecture be formulated strictly in terms of the derived category uh, of a variety, and if it can, then you can sort of uh, uh, you can get some way with the original conjecture as well. So let me just give you one example um, of, of how this works. So, um, so here's a theorem uh, by Tabuada uh, is if uh, x1 and x2 are such that they are derived equivalent, uh, and uh, numerical equivalence It's the same thing as homological equivalence on X1, then uh, the same thing is also true on X2. So this numerical equivalence being equal to homological equivalence is preserved under these derived equivalents, under, under, uh, under passing from a variety to a, to a derived equivalent variety. So in this way, one can. <clears throat> so I'm not. I'm not fully up on the on the state of to the extent to the like to what extent this is known, but there are um, using this kind of uh, technique and and slightly more sort of refined results. You can you can uh, you can reach some new cases uh, like uh, of uh, proving this this conjecture and other. Uh, can, I, can I have a question? Yeah. So is this question, uh, is this theorem only for characteristic zero, or maybe you cannot know more general? Yeah, the uh, the the short answer is I don't know, but I I seem to recall that there's there's also you can also allow characteristic p, um, like non-zero characteristics. Um, Yeah, that's that's as far as I, I mean. It's uh, but uh, if you um, like all, all this is all taken from a from a from Tabuada survey uh, paper from around like twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen, which yeah. So um, it's all it's all stated very cleanly there. So so it should be easy to. I, I think it also works in characteristic non zero. Right. Okay. So this was just a, a, a very uh, brief aside, brief uh, uh, 
sorry, uh, small connection uh, to, the, to the theme of this conference. Um, so given that we now have sort of multiple reasons for, for trying to find these, these examples of things which are distinct, but um, but throughout the question. Yeah. Do we need to assume uh, X and uh, X1 and X2 have uh, seven dimensions? Because uh, there, there are categories I, I can include. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't catch. Do we need to assume they have? Do we need to assume that these two varieties, X1 and X2, uh, are, are, they have the same dimension? Uh, so ah, um, well, uh, let me say, I don't. You don't need. Uh, it follows. I mean, they they, if they are drug equivalent, then they must then they must uh, also have the same dimension. So it's not it's not an assumption. It's just it's just uh, yeah. It, it it's a consequence of them uh, of x one and x two. Uh, so right, so there's no, so you don't, you don't go to sort of get to go up in dimension using this theorem. Um, you sort of, you, you don't get to prove it for for things of higher dimension using uh, things of lower dimension uh, using this theorem. But there are other, there are in fact, in, there are in fact other ways in which you can sort of connect varieties, connect varieties at a graph level which is weaker than than actual equivalence, where you can go from something of low dimension to higher dimension and uh, yeah, deduce something. Uh, a bit more interesting, or a bit sort of yeah. Uh, there are ways of connecting things, connecting varieties, where you change the dimension. So um, yeah, so you can exploit the fact that one of them is in low dimension, and therefore you know lots of things. And then yeah. Um. Right. Okay. So 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 where do we where do we find such examples? Well, uh, the main sort of technical tool we have for uh, there are various ways, but the, by far the most sort of uh, recently successful one uh, for producing such examples is known as homological uh, projective duality. And so this is a theory invented and developed by Kuznetsov from well first formulated in, in 2006 and sort of continually developed since then, uh, which is a tool for uh, basically for, 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 I mean, you can, you can think of it as a tool for computing, uh, computing certain kinds of varieties. So the right category of certain kinds of varieties. Uh, so it's not a, you shouldn't expect this to sort of tell you anything about a, a general arbitrary variety, but uh, uh, as we'll see a certain class of varieties and you can say interesting things about uh, using this. And this, this turns out to produce lots of interesting examples. Uh, so uh, you can think of this as some kind of, um, you can think of this theory as some kind of machine where the, the input is two things. So you start with uh, a projective smooth variety. So uh, smooth and projective variety living inside some given projective space. And uh, to get uh, to get this to run, you also need to assume that we have. So this is the this is where things get sort of algebraic and and, and fairly technical. But uh, it's something known as a Lefschetz decomposition. Uh, of the derived category. So this is a uh, semi-orthogonal decomposition. So a semi-orthogonal decomposition. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, explain what that is, but it's the notation is kind of uh, suggestive, I think. Uh, so, so you write dx as this sort of uh, span of the C0 up to Cn, and here uh, the Ci, uh, the Ci are all uh, triangulated categories. And just to, to set it, like uh, roughly speaking, this means dx splits up into, it's not quite a, like a, it's not, it's not a direct sum as a category of these CIs, but it's some, something like that. It's some kind of, uh, 
maybe uh, you should think of it as DS, DX having a filtration where the where the individual graded pieces of the filtration are the are the CIs. So essentially, like the uh, DX is built out of the simpler blocks, which are these uh, triangular categories CI. So uh, elastic decomposition is a semi orthogonal decomposition with special properties. Let me just it's not it's not important first. The, the the main thing I want to I want you like if you're sort of seeing this for the first time the, the main thing to take away is having a lecture decomposition is a is a difficult is a, is a rare thing so you shouldn't expect it for to work for an arbitrary smooth and projective variety inside PM in the really typical examples are like homogeneous spaces or hypersurfaces of low degree that's where you expect to find lecture decompositions and for a general thing you wouldn't you wouldn't have this data so you wouldn't get the the machine the machine wouldn't start basically. But um, assuming you have this, uh, you have then the following consequence. So the first lemma in the, in the theory uh, proved by Kuznetsova is then that if you have, so this left stress decomposition is telling you that you can sort of, is, is in one way saying you understand the derived category of this X pretty well. Now the next lemma is you also understand the derived category of a divisor inside X pretty well. So if this thing is a uh, hyperplane, then um, then we have uh, a semi a new semi-orthogonal decomposition of um, uh, the divisor X intersect H. So this uh, new semi-orthogonal decomposition looks like the following thing. So you have C1, C2, and N here should be kept N for the, this is just some, it's not, sorry, the, uh, the N here was not meant to be the same then. Uh, so you keep the, some of the pieces in the left decomposition. So in some ways, the, the drug categories is kind of unchanged, and then you introduce a new one. So. CH is, uh, okay, so CH is called the interesting piece. I think that is the official name for it. Um, so you have, um, you understand DX by understanding these, uh, these simpler pieces here. Um, DXA, the, uh, this uh, device inside X uh, has mostly the same pieces, which you understood from before. So those are kind of trivial and uninteresting. Whereas this thing is new and interesting. So the uh, the analogy here and the explanation for the term Lepschitz decomposition is that this is this is meant to look like um, the Lepschitz hyperplane theorem. So in the Lepschitz hyperplane theorem, you, if you understand the cohomology of some variety, uh, you more or less understand the cohomology of the of a divisor of a hyperplane inside it. So the middle, like the non-middle cohomology, when you take a hyperplane inside a variety, it's just inherited from the ambient variety. Like these pieces are inherited from X. And in the middle cohomology, you see something new and interesting. So this, this CH is kind of plays the role of the, of the middle cohomology uh, in, in the lecture hyperplane theorem. So, um, so, and also like the, these pieces are fixed and like the middle cohomology, this is a thing that varies when you vary H. Okay, so um, basically the, the next thing to do is, okay, what do we do with these, uh, these um, CHs? Well, we can then use uh, those to build a new variety. So uh, the HP uh, dual variety Variety uh, is a variety Y mapping to PN with this uh, check on top of it. So this is the dual projective space where the, the points in here correspond to hyperplanes in the original PN uh, is such that so how do we define this? Well, this is this is a hand wavy definition, but it's it's uh, you can just uh, you can say lots of things about it by knowing that um, the derived category of the fibers 
Uh, so here you have hyperplane corresponds to a point, hyperplane in PN corresponds to a point in here. And I want the derived category of the fiber here to be, to be the interesting piece. So Y is more or less obtained by taking, for each hyperplane, you take the interesting piece and you stick those together in a, in a, in a big family over the, uh, over the dual projective space. And I should say, uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So, so in this uh, uh, orthogonal decomposition, uh, are these uh, C1, C2 are sorted, sorted in this way so that, for example, if you take a uh, half plan again to, to cover this uh, X, exactly with, uh, with this edge? I'm, I'm sorry, I, it's, I'm, uh, I'm not hearing you very well. Is there, uh, where's the microphone? Is there? <laughs> Oh, I mean, my question is, uh, so here you have one half plan. If you take uh, another half plan, yeah. then here you get uh, another E edge prime or you, you change some E1, E2 to another E, e edge. So, uh, right, so this is, this is a good, uh, I mean, this is essentially what we'll be doing. We'll be, we'll be iterating this. So if you do this, uh, let me just briefly tell you the answer to the question, like if you if you take, you're asking about this thing, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, then uh, the more or less the same uh, same lemma would would give you that you have this thing, and then you drop C one, so then you, it goes from C two and up. So, so getting getting two, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is that is that answering your question? Like you get instead of instead of the C depending on yeah yeah okay so so note that uh, Y uh, may not exist actually uh, may not exist um, as a variety uh, or even or even scheme I mean that's not the problem here uh, the um, the, the problem is just just requiring this property here that that you find a variety having this this particular property might be too much to ask for so instead uh, instead it's defined uh, as a non commutative variety which is is, is a scary name for just a triangular category. So, so it's it's. I mean, it's not worth going into here. But if you want to set up the theory properly, you want to, You really need to make to switch from like looking at varieties to just strictly working with triangular categories and trying to do geometry exclusively or exclusively with triangular categories. But it turns out in many cases, Y does exist as a variety. So let's just pretend it does for the for our purposes. It uh, it works, and let's let's pretend we can we can write down the HP dual, which is a variety. And then in full generality, one has to sort of think about how to translate that uh, into like just doing translated categories. Anyway, um, okay, so 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 through all these sort of uh, technical uh, uh, definitions, and and I've all I'm, I've I've I've, uh, I've hidden away a lot of things. But what do we have? Where, where are we at so far? We have this X mapping to PN, and we have constructed the dual Y uh, mapping to PN dual. And now the question is, okay, so what is, what is that good for? Why, why do we want to have this, this dual variety? So the, the, the reason this is interesting is the following, um, the main theorem, uh, so this is Kuznetsov's main theorem for HP duality is, uh, is the following thing. Um, you can now try to understand, so you don't want to relate, it's not like a natural guess would be that you relate the derived category of X with the derived category of Y. That's not quite what you do. What you do is you take, uh, so we let L inside of PN be uh, a linear subspace. Okay, so then that, that means, so you can take the, the fiber product, the equation, um, and then the base change, right? So uh, if say, um, so 
for instance, uh, you can you can take the intersection of two two devices, right? Um, that, that would be the example discussed. Uh, we we talked a little bit about uh, two minutes ago, and uh, we can then let uh, L perp inside the dual projective space uh, be the orthogonal complement. So by definition, there is a pairing between the, the, the uh, between Tn and, and this uh, the dual projective space. Okay, so then take the base change uh, of that. Okay, then the quite then the point is these two base changes are related. So then dxl is related to dyl per. Okay, so um, there are uh, there's one thing I need to say, which is uh, what is this? Uh, what do I mean by this thing? So this thing means that so it means something slightly subtle. It means that there exists a triangular category C. Uh, such that, so an explicit such that uh, C lives inside the XL. You can think of C as living inside the XL, and you can also think of it as living inside the YL. Per for our purposes, the only the only thing we need is that uh, in good cases. In good cases, uh, it actually means uh, we don't, it actually means that there's an equivalence. We have uh, that D of XL is equivalent to D of YL perp. And and it's easy to tell which cases are good and not. I mean, it's not like the, the theory spits out explicitly what the relation is between between the XL and the YL perp. It's just I don't want to get into how one determines this, but it's like you have extremely extremely fine control over, over how these how these are related. So this is now this is now is a way of generating interesting examples because. Um, uh, can can you go up a little bit? Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, go up. Maybe this uh, F is not a uh, morphism, right? Because if you have H, if H, if somehow H contains X, then. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Uh, if H contains X, then. So I should say, I mean, uh, I've, I'm dropping, I'm dropping a. a, 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 a there's, there are a ton of assumptions I'm not stating here. So I'm I'm just giving you the rough picture here where you should really ex you should really want intersections to be transverse and um, so H containing X is like a that's like that would be like a pathological case where we'd have to restate the definition. Is that is that answering your question or? Yeah 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 no I mean good point I should have mentioned this like I'm I'm really just sort of giving you. Um, a very rough outline of like what the um, so one should also require like these uh, this L to be sort of generic enough that this thing is smooth and uh, and then and one actually shows that this thing is smooth but yeah there's lots of lots of caveats but this is sort of just uh, assume these holds and things are generic and smooth and intersecting transversely then you get then you get this this result. Mm. Okay, so uh, so right, so what does this give like at a rough level? Okay, so what does this do for us? Like, there are two things to say here. Um, so we build y. So we have uh, we build y from these uh, from these uh, from understanding the derived categories of x h, right? So taking these c h's, that's what we use to build y, and. Uh, Basically, XL is the intersection of more than one divisor, right? Uh, it could be two, could be more. Uh, so what we're getting here is some kind of, one way to say it is we get some kind of understanding of the intersection of more divisors from something that we build out of understanding the derived category of just one device. So we're sort of bootstrapping up from understanding 
each divisor in X individually to understanding intersections of divisors. Uh, so Y is built out of like individual divisors and we can sort of then understand uh, the intersection of more divisors from our understanding of, of single divisors. And this, and, and there's just no like a priori reason to expect that XL and YL are closely related geometrically. So this opens the way to sort of proving the right of covalences between things which are not on the face of it closely related, in, in particular, like not, not by rational. So, um, like, so let me just give you one, one simple example of, of how this theory runs in practice. Uh, so if we take the Grassmannian 2, 5, this lives inside of P9. So if we take this to be X, then the HP dual is, uh, is in fact also the Grassmannian 2, 5, but now thought of as living inside the dual projective space. Okay, and what is the, uh, so this is a, a computation one can make and Kuznetsov uh, did, and what does the main theorem then tell us? Well, one, let's say just, let's try and apply this main theorem in one particular case. Uh, let's suppose uh, L is P4, that means L perp is also a P4. Um, and then we find that the derived category of the Grassmannian 2, 5 intersect L. In fact, in this case, one checks it's actually the, this relation is an equivalence. Uh, so you get this, this equivalence between uh, these two uh, varieties. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is particularly unexciting because they turn out to be the same. Uh, right, it turns out this is a, a drug category of an elliptic curve, and this is also a drug category of the same elliptic curve, but not obviously so. But still, it's not a. This is not a. This is not an exciting application, but it's a. It's a simple one. Um, so, but you can really like this is this is the way you sort of you apply this. You just take take a concrete variety. If you can compute the HP dual, you can then really get some understanding of linear sections of this of this variety. Okay, so now let me um, let me just state um, state one uh, upgrade to the main theorem, which is what we use technically, and then I'll uh, I'll wrap this up. So um, there's the following. Uh, so this was HP duality uh, as formulated in 2006, which was used uh, to great effect, and we sort of could produce lots of interesting examples using using this. There's an update to it. Uh, from quite recently, uh, which is due to uh, so independently, Jiang, uh, Young, and Xie, um, and then later Kuznetsov, uh, Perry proved the following statement. So if x1 and x2 are in Pn, uh, with HP duals Y1, Y2 um, in the dual projective space, then you can do the following thing. Instead of taking linear sections, you now take intersections. So you intersect X1 with X2, and that then should be related to Y1 intersect y2 so i have no i have no particular like uh, good way of well not for the previous theorem and not for this one i have no way of like explaining why this like in a simple way why this is a, a reasonable thing but this is turns out to be this turns out to be the way the the, the hp duality works it relates intersection on one side with uh, intersections on the other side and then uh, basically, if we now take, so taking uh, x1 to be the Grassmannian 2, 5 inside p9, x2 to be the translate of that, inside p9, so here g 
as before with some general translate, general element in the in this linear group. Uh, this gives us that y1 is the Grassmannian, 2, 5 inside this dual protective space, and y2 is g inverse transpose. And then we find that uh, the derived category of uh, x1 intersect x2 is actually equivalent to the derived category of y1 intersect y2. And these were the examples we had before. So this is the, this is the, you, I mean, <laughs> in, in case you've forgotten, this is, this is how we defined the, um, what we claimed gave a counterexample to by rational theory. So this is, this is where this comes from. And uh, so there were lots of details. I just like the main, the main point I, I wanted to get across is just uh, that I mean, uh, for, for various reasons, constructing these uh, equivalents between the equivalences between different varieties at the level of derived categories is, is interesting. And we have a, a pretty uh, strong tool, which is uh, yeah, I don't know, continually being developed for doing, for doing so, which is, which is called homological protective duality. So this is one application of that machine. Anyway, yeah, thanks. No, thank you, uh, Jürgen. Uh, any uh, any question? Yeah, so uh, so you may open the y y x one intersect x two now by the signal to y one intersect y two. So, right, so, uh, you're saying I need I need to prove that x one intersect x two is not birational to y one intersect y two. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in the, and that, that's in particular why we can put our name on this result. So, uh, in fact, what I gave you here is sort of the, the general machine, and applying that general machine to a particular example, it's like gives you a half a page proof that these two different guys are derived equivalent. So, that then becomes a ten page paper when you when you actually have to sit down and prove that they're not uh, birational. So that is, I mean, that's the main. Uh, uh, that's the main effort on our part is to is to actually prove that these are not uh, are not birational. <clears throat> so this is, I mean, it's the, and this is doable because the the Scalabia threefolds have uh, have cyclic Picard groups, so they're birational if and only if they're isomorphic, and they sit in projective space in such a way that they're isomorphic if and only if they're projectively equivalent. And then that is something one ha one has. I mean, it's still not trivial, but that is something manageable to prove that these two different ones are not. There's no, we are left with sort of checking that there's no automorphism. There's no uh, element in in, um, in GL10, which takes one to the other, which is doable. But that's that's where, that's, what, that's the work we put in, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Um, so if no question, let's thank uh, Jürgen again.